We're talking with Michelle Cordy, who's a grade three and four teacher in Canada. And I'm particularly interested in that phrase that you see in the background, hack the classroom. She's got a website about hack the classroom. And Michelle considers herself to uh, also be an applied researcher. Where did this hack the classroom business come from for you, Michelle? Hack the Classroom came from two places. Uh, firstly, I was partnering with uh, my colleague, Dr. Donna Kostopoulos, on investigating student thinking and using e-portfolios. And we ended up uh, purchasing a class out of iPad. But the iPad devices weren't really fitting within the ecosystem, the technology ecosystem that I was part of in my school board. So literally, we had to sort of do, do some problem solving around how the workflows were and working within that system. But at the same time, you realize that that makes for larger challenges and larger aspects of um, gain, figuring out how you're doing something for the first time. When there's no example to follow, you kind of have to hack your way through and, and figure out. So that's where it came from. Um, and also, um, I read uh, this book here, Coding Freedom, and I learned about the social aspects of hacking and how hackers are really these people that come together to solve problems in creative and unique ways, and that really resonated with me, uh, and it gave me sort of this feeling of empowerment that I could find other people that were passionate about trying to make changes in education, and together we could just go about doing it. There is a sense of urgency that the time for baby steps has has long past us and that we need to do something. So we need to get into the source code of education and just start writing new code. So um, you're teaching uh, grades three and four. What what about e-portfolios for grades three and four? What good does it do and and how did it work? I think that initially the good that I thought it would do was that these students would collect artifacts, they would share them with each other, with their parents, with, with me, and they would be able to get feedback. But then I realized something a lot more powerful. As soon as these learning artifacts are available online, then you invite a much larger group of people to invite, to comment, and to participate in their learning. And that had much larger implications for how students viewed themselves. All of a sudden, they had this sense that they could impart their will on the world and be part of a larger conversation that expanded beyond the classroom. And I think that is a feeling that I personally have had on the internet. And to give that to my students who are eight, nine years old made me realize that this is an important feeling and it has downstream effects for their participation in daily life and democracy and beyond. So what, in, in what form do a th third or fourth grade classroom use e-portfolios? What does it look like? How do they Last year, <laughs> Last year, well, they create their artifacts of learning, uh, multimedia artifacts of their learning with iPads. So they would uh, create a video that would capture photos of uh, a science experiment and then add on some voice recording to reflect metacognitively to do the thinking about thinking with the science project. And then they would post that on a blog for broader commenting. This year, we're moving forward to having more of the peer-to-peer -peer assessment because we realized that that was an that was available to us. So we're moving forward with using Blogger and Google Sites because they're just so simple to use for my young young learners. Um, kids are so used to being graded by their teachers. Uh, how do you get them to get started on peer assessment? You focus on the success criteria. You focus on what it is that we get to do here. What are the Lego building blocks that are going to create this really amazing artifact of our learning. And I think if you focus on that, and I don't really worry too much about the grades, I worry about moving each individual student forward. And then when the dialogue is around that, and the teacher has a clear idea in her mind about what it is that you're learning, the students help co-create that, then, you know, the marks are kind of gone, and the only thing that's up for grabs is learning. What kind of reaction do you get from, from students when you introduce this? I think a mix. 
initially we follow uh, the life cycle of a project, I call it. Uh, it's sort of a V-shaped emotional graph, if you will. They start off really positive, thinking that it's going to be really magical with, oh, this is going to be great. And then they realize, oh, this is going to be hard and this is going to take some work. And there's a lot of uh, things that I need to do. I need to app smash a bunch of things together. I need to follow these steps. Oh, I have to work with my partner. And they realize it's hard work. And then they slump down. Oh, this might take some time. This is challenging. And we try to skip the very bottom of that V-shaped graph where they want to quit. Try to skip that and fight what we call in my classroom the boring monster. The boring monster makes you want to get a drink, talk with your friends. So we try to have all these um, awarenesses about what's involved with doing complex hard work. And then they slowly start to rise out of that life cycle of the project emotional curve and they go, oh, I'm getting somewhere. And then finally they get to this point where they've finished their task and they feel this has been a good thing. Not quite as fantastic as I initially envisioned, but next time I will. So you get this iterative process of reflection and a hunger for more, but definitely it's when you're doing large projects that are technically challenging, intellectually challenging, there, there's an emotional piece of developing one's grit to stick to it. Just like a hacker, too. Like a lot of hackers are spent, spend a lot of time coding and with ones and zeros. And you have to understand that delayed gratification is a part of it. Well, maybe you have a little bit of an advantage with third and fourth graders. So uh, I teach uh, university students and that V you're talking about is very much there for them, but I think there's also a large element of learned helplessness. By the time they get into an elite university, they have been trained really, really well to, uh, to pass the test or to get good grades on the test, not particularly to do things like peer assessment and collaborative Work. But I think that's a I think that's a problem with education as well because we're not attending to one of the fundamental um, aspects that is that inspired me from hacker mindsets and that is uh, you know the first rule in Eric S Raymond's Cathedral in the Bazaar which is widely ha held as the hacker manifesto is we need to work on things, projects we need and we want. We must scratch a personal itch. And when students' voices aren't coming through in the classroom and they're not the ones posing the questions and they don't own the learning and they're not scratching a personal itch, I think that they get detuned to having that itch, having that curiosity, and then what to do about it. So I think that that apathy that you see at higher ed is, you know, something that we've lost through the process of education. And indeed, it's a huge, huge loss, not just in education, but to our overall gross domestic happiness and productivity. So what advice would you give to other teachers, third and fourth grade teachers, but at, at any level, about how to get started doing what you're doing? I would start with scratching a personal edge I, that is co-created between you and your students. What is it that you want to learn, make, or do in the classroom that's going to invite in a world of others to comment, to up-level, that's going to open your eyes to, to feeling curious and brave? I, that would be the first thing. The second thing is look for other people that are doing creative and amazing things to help set the bar for what's possible. Uh, it would not be without mentors. I, I would not have come on this thought process if it hadn't been for you, for other people that are connected in my personal learning network. So you have to seek out people that are doing daring and amazing things in cooperative settings to feel that it's possible. And, you know, I think we also need to bring it back to first principles. What are we truly trying to achieve in education? We want our students to think and to think about thinking. And so when you start there and you don't worry about whether students are learning, you know, the date uh, for a particular event that happened in history, if you go broader, then the affordances get equally broad. How do you get a third or fourth grader started thinking about thinking? 
you do it yourself, I think, as the teacher. I mean, so much of what we do with young learners is through our modeling. So by doing think alouds and modeling to students that you're, you're, you're thinking about your thinking, whether you're reading a story aloud or whether you're modeling problem solving of a particular problem. Oh, I, that's what I did there. Sort of these asides to yourself that you are specifically pointing out to students that thinking is something that nobody sees, but you can make that visible, make that explicit by labeling it, talking about it, sketching about it. So I think the very first place it comes from is teacher modeling. And then you insist that that's just, that's what we do here. And of course, it's so much easier to go down that process when you have devices in your class where you can be capturing video, capturing audio, capturing photographs that you can then annotate in other software so that that process is very rich in thinking about thinking. What's next on the horizon for you? What are you, what are you uh, planning to experiment with next? There is my big blue sky thinking and then my more concrete next steps. I'll do big blue sky thinking first. I'm very, very attracted to the idea of the maker movement and DIY uh, and what that might inform in the classroom. Going back to that idea of what happens when we give students access to rich, engaging, powerful artifacts for learning. What happens? So what happens if Arduino makes its way into the classroom or Lego Mindstorms Robotics and how does that help students see the possibilities and see that through their tinkering they can impart their will in the world. So I'd love to continue to explore that area and make it happen in my classroom. And my next step more concretely is to keep pushing what I'm currently doing. Trying my hardest to, to show students that it's worth going through that emotional curve to create meaningful, rich artifacts of your learning and talk and think about it. Wonderful, Michelle. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Howard. Thanks for all your inspiration and for chatting with me today.